On this, the December 17th, 2023 edition of What's Going On with Shipping, it looks like we're going to get Red Sea convoys courtesy of the Houthi in Yemen. I am your host, Sal Mercogliano. So if you follow what's going on with shipping, you know we've been documenting what has happened to commercial shipping in and around the Red Sea, the Bab el-Mandab, and the Gulf of Aden. Well, now it appears that the United States, along with its allies, will be initiating a convoy operation entitled Operation Prosperous Guardian, once again proving that U.S. Navy codenames come from chat GBT. We're going to document what this means, why is this happening, and more importantly, what role have the commercial firms played in getting this done? If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So convoying, not new to the U.S. Uh, we did it in World War I, World War II, but the most recent version we've done is quite a few years ago. It's at the tail end of the 1980s in what's called Operation Earnest Will. This was the end of the tanker war between Iran and Iraq in the Persian Gulf. Uh, Iran and Iraq have been targeting tankers from each side throughout that conflict. 450 tankers were hit during this conflict. But in 1987, Kuwait, fearing its tanker fleet, and more importantly, its loss of revenue, went to the United States and asked if they could guard and convoy out their ships. The U.S. agreed to do so only if the Kuwaitis reflagged their ships to the U.S. registry. Now we're looking at a similar situation, but also with its differences, because the U.S. is not looking at reflagging vessels, but actually escorting ships that are not of the U.S. registry, and we're going to discuss that in some detail. So the information of this comes out from G Captain Pentagon to launch Operation Prosperity Guardian to reopen the Red uh, Sea Passage. This is a story from John Conrad. The word is coming out that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, which is on a Mideast junket, he's heading to Israel among, among many other countries, will announce this initiative on Monday. This is following a series of attacks against ships and a untold number of drones, UAVs, and missiles that have been shot down by the United States. What's interesting about this is what John has to say here in the second and third paragraph. G Captain is verified from a prominent ship owner whose vessels are currently on temporary hold outside the Red Sea following the attack by Houthis on a mare ship Thursday, that they've been engaged in talks with U.S. Department of Defense regarding prospective initiative. This would be a sharp turn from a White House statement on Friday, which we talked about in our last video, saying that Maersk and the other companies must weigh the balance of risk and benefit of the transit of their ships all around the world. So it sounded like the United States was not going to get involved in this type of escort mission for a variety of reasons. There was a question about whether or not the U.S. Navy would be escorting U.S. flagged vessels because there are U.S. flagged vessels that sail in and out of this area all the time. Matter of fact, we just saw a ship come through the Bab el Mandab with an escort provided. Now, the U.S. is reinforcing the area. Sixth Fleet announced the transits of three Arleigh Burke class destroyers on December 11th, 14th, and the 17th, the Laboon, the Delbert. D. Black and the Sullivans. They would join Thomas Hudner, Mason, and Carney. So you would have a six pack of destroyers in and around that region, not to mention destroyers that are attached to the Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group, which is now sortied out of the Persian Gulf and is in the Gulf of Aden. So uh, add to it, you have the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group in the Northern Red Sea. So you have a lot of fleet concentration here for the Fifth Fleet in and around this area. This is all being initiated because on December 15th, shipping lines began to announce that they were pausing their Red Sea voyages. Initially, the announcement came out from uh, Maersk and Hopog Lloyd, but now we've seen CMA, CGM have joined in. Now, those four companies are four of the biggest shipping firms in the world. They represent over 50% of the world's container capacity among them. And also, to be clear, they're all based in Europe. So you got Maersk, which is Denmark, Hophog Lloyd, which is Germany, Mediterranean shipping, which is uh, Switzerland and Italy. And then you have CMA, CGM, which is France. It's interesting to note that you're not seeing the Asian uh, container lines, O&E. HMM, Yangmin, and Evergreen doing this. Uh, Zim, which is one of the other large ones, had already done this because they knew they were being targeted uh, by the Houthi. So now you're seeing four of the biggest shipping lines diverting their vessels. At the same time, we're seeing the rise in another issue, and that is hijacking. 
Uh, early on, we saw the hi attempted hijacking of a ship, the Central Park. Uh, this was thwarted by the ship's crew, stopping the vessel, seeking shelter down in the vessel, and holding out until a U.S. Navy destroyer, USS Mason, arrived, boarded the vessel, and then actually apprehended the five Somalis fleeing the vessel. But the Somalis were not fleeing to Somalia. They were heading to Yemen. And while this story says suspected hijacking in the ocean may mark return of the Somali piracy, I don't think this is the Somali piracy of the 2000s, 2010. This is not Maersk, Alabama. It's not Captain Phillips. It's not Tom Hanks being grabbed. These Somalis are working with Yemen. The Ruan, which is this Bulgarian-owned Malta flag bulker, has just entered northern waters of Somalia. And what you would typically see in Somali piracy is the vessel would hit Somali waters, anchor, and then a, a ransom note would be sent to the shipping company and request millions of dollars be sent to them. I don't think we're seeing this here. I think while this ship is being pursued by a Spanish and Indian warship, this ship is eventually going to make its way to Yemen. It's going to cross the Gulf of Aden to Yemen. That's what my suspicion is. But you have basically two things going on here. You have hijackings going on in the Gulf of Aden, and then you have these attacks in the Red Sea. And just to quickly recap, back in November, November 14th, the Houthi announced their intention to target Israeli-affiliated ships. These are ships flagged in Israel, which are very few, or ships with Israeli ownership, Zim Lines and a few other companies that have connections. And this resulted in the 19 November seizure of the Galaxy Leader, a very dramatic seizure where an MI-17 helicopter landed on the ship and Houthi military seized the vessel and have sailed that ship into Yemen waters. They're right now holding the vessel and the crew hostage and not treating them very nice either, I might add. So that was the first overt act. Then on 3 December, you saw a series of attacks against three vessels. This is where the destroyer USS Kearney earned its title as, as the badass Burke-class destroyer of ever, being able to knock down multiple uh, drones, UAVs, and cruise missiles sent its way. The three ships were able to continue on. The Houthi escalated this on 9 December by declaring all ships calling at Israel as legitimate targets. And they backed that up with an attack on 11 December against the tanker Strinda. This was a tanker heading from Malaysia to Italy, but the ship had shown up in a future port call in the Israeli port of Ashdod. But subsequently, other attacks against the Ardmore Encounter, the Maersk Gibraltar, and other ships demonstrate that the Houthi are targeting ships that have nothing to do with Israel. Maersk Gibraltar is the perfect example. That ship, Chinese-owned, Maersk Company, Hong Kong flagged, was heading north through the Red Sea, heading up into the Mediterranean, was going to stop at ports in and around the Mediterranean, not Israel, and then come back. No connection at all to Israel. And yet the Houthi have begun their large-scale attacks. And you can see that this is the United Kingdom's Maritime Trade Organization, uh, uh, excuse me, Trade Operations website. And you can see how the attacks are all clustered here around Yemen on the Red Sea side through the Bab el-Mandab to the Gulf of Aden. And then you do have the Ruan, these pirate attacks out here in the Gulf of Aden, which are extremely disturbing because that indicates a mothership is operating out in the area. The result of this has been diversions from the Suez Canal. On uh, 19 November, the Suez Canal announced that so far 55 ships have rerouted or basically canceled their scheduled sailings through the Suez Canal and are heading around the Cape of Good Hope. Now, 55 ships sounds like a lot, but that's out of 2,128 ships. This represents just 2.5% of the total ships going through the Suez Canal and subsequently the Bab el Mandab. Now, for Suez, this is obviously an issue. Each ship going through is about a half a million dollars in tolls. That represents about $27.5 million that the Egyptians are losing at this point. Understand that the Suez Canal generates billions of dollars for Egypt. They usually have anywhere between 55 to 90 ships a day go through the Suez Canal. And obviously, Egypt's fear is this magnifies and you start seeing the number of ships going down that are passing through that region. 
going around the Cape of Good Hope is not the best solution. Let's be clear about this. You're talking about adding 3,500 miles to a voyage from Singapore to Rotterdam. That is anywhere from seven to 14 days, depending on ship speeds. Uh, it's more voyage if you have to go back into the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar. But the issue here isn't just the loss of the Suez Canal toll and the added fuel you're paying, but it's time. This is now throwing off schedules of deliveries. Uh, cargo is booked to arrive at a port at a certain time. You get a berth. You have trucks and 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 uh, drayage and and trains set up to move the cargo. Some of this cargo is getting transshipped to other ships. This is going to cause a kind of a butterfly effect down the entire supply chain. Heading around the southern tip of South Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, it's summertime, so situation is good. We've got months until the weather turns bad. But if you've been following what's going on with shipping, you would know that South Africa is suffering a lot of issues right now. They've got port congestion. They had port strikes. There are issues uh, down in that area. And while most ships will just sail past the area, some ships are, will have to stop to refuel. Other ships may want to stop to reload their cargo that's going to places like the United States, for example. A lot of cargo that's going on this east-west route between Europe and Asia gets transloaded in the big ports at Algeciras, at Rotterdam, at Felixstowe, over to the United States. They may want to do some transloading down in Durban in South Africa, but again, you're limited down there in the facilities you have. So when you look at global shipping, and this is Marine Traffic's website, a perfect, if you don't have the app downloaded on your phone, if you don't have this on your computer, you really should. It is a great site. I cleaned this up to just show cargo ships and tankers. Cargo ships are in green, red are tankers. And you can see how choke points play such a significant role. Cargo coming out of Asia, for example, goes through the South China Sea, through the Singapore Straits, out into the Straits of Malacca, and then up here into the Indian Ocean above uh, Sumatra. It then branches into two branches. One heads down to South Africa this way. So you already have a lot of traffic heading that way. The other branch heads south of Sri Lanka, India, heading toward either the Bab el Mandab or to the Straits of Hormuz. And then you come up here into the Suez through either into the Black Sea or out through the Straits of Gibraltar. And you have it down in South Africa, the trade route kind of diverges again into three branches. One heads across to South America. One heads up along the northern shore of South America toward the United States and the Caribbean. And then one heads up toward Europe. And if you start reducing the amount of ships coming through the Bab el Mandab here, then you're going to see a serious disruption. So finally, let me talk about why I think this is happening the way it is. So there were a lot of calls for the United States and Western navies and Asian navies to begin convoying. And I understand convoying through this area is, 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 is really not going to work. You're not going to see World War II style convoys set up. Probably what we're going to see is a series of ships stationed along the eastern side of the track between basically the main shipping channel in Yemen, basically set up kind of guard posts with vessels to catch any missiles or drones heading out that way and try to set up a wall. That's probably what you are going to see because convoying through the area means you're going to have to stop ships. You're going to have to gather them together. You're going to have to go at the speed of the slowest ship in the convoy. It's going to take a lot of vessels to do that. Because of the size of Yemen and the coast involved, you're probably just going to see these kind of gatekeepers set up and provide this kind of shield to protect them, which is going to mean you need a lot of ships to do that because you're going to have to replace vessels as vessels expend ammunition and, and, and run down on it. They're going to have to run the Djibouti to go replenish themselves. You're going to have to refuel them. Uh, you're just going to need a lot of vessels to kind of do this. But the issue I want to get to is not really the tactics of this because we're going to see what exactly the, the tactics are going to be when they announce this. I want to talk about the motivation for it. So this story from G, G Captain John Conrad, I talked about it in yesterday's video. EU shipping and U.S. naval leaders are a despite NATO budget boost. Uh, the companies that are doing this, I think, are leveraging the Western navies and the U.S. to make this happen. And particularly, I, I want to focus on one aspect of this. Now, understand, shipping companies right now, the container shipping companies, because that's who's doing this right now, are facing a twofold problem. Number one, 
their prospect for 2024 is not good. This is Zentia, which is an analytics group that does shipping. Put this out, forecast as a stormy 2024, our shipping line set sight on freight, li- freight rate increases. So basically the ocean shipping carriers and those four I talked about are right in the midst of this. All have basically overproduced ships. So they've got brand new tonnage coming on. That means they're going to have overcapacity. They have too much shipping. Uh, secondly, freight rates have absolutely fallen to the bottom level. We've seen them just absolutely collapse. And that's because, again, we're coming off the peaks of the global supply chain crisis. And that means profits for companies like Maersk, MSC, Hop Hog Line, and CMA CGM are all down at this time. Now, what we saw on Friday was stocks for all these companies, along with many other companies, shipping companies, went through the roof. I mean, it just boosted. Why is that? Because if you got to go around the Cape of Good Hope, you're going to need more ships. It's going to cost more because of fuel and delays, which means that cost is going to be translated to higher freight rates. So this is a win-win for the ocean shipping carriers. Uh, and, you know, some very smart people were talking about this. Uh, Greg Miller at Freight Waves. Uh, 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 Fernley had an article. Uh, oh, excuse me, there's an article in Trade Winds quoting this from Fernley. G Captain was talking about this. So we were, a lot of the maritime sites were looking at this. However, one of the issues that kept coming up here was that there were U.S. flagged vessels that kept going through it, including of some of these ocean carriers. So for example, this is uh, marine traffic, but I pulled out just U.S. flagged vessels that are in and around the area. And so for example, one of the vessels here is Alliance Fairfax, uh, over here, you'll see uh, uh, the Lions Fairfax had just come through the Bab el Mandab and is heading up into the area of the Persian Gulf. But over here, you see a ship called the Mare Chicago. And Mare Chicago had come out of Salat here in Oman. It was heading toward the Bab el Mandab when all of a sudden it turned around. At the same time, up in the Red Sea, the Mare's Kensington, which came out of the Suez Canal, also hove to and stopped. Now, other Maersk ships are heading the way to the Bab el-Mandeb. You have Maersk uh, Sentosa heading that way. You have Maersk Durban, Maersk Kinloss, Maersk Sar- Saratoga. They're all coming out. These are ships of what is called the Maritime Security Program. So this is a fleet created back in 1996. Uh, one of the things that came out of the first Persian Gulf War was the realization that we really need a U.S. merchant marine to provide sustainment. And so one of the programs that was allowed to fail was something called operational differential subsidies. And so the maritime security program was that. Basically, they set up the system where the U.S. government would pay a operator to keep their ship in the U.S. flag on essential trade routes. And initially, one of the companies that got it was a company called Sealand. Sealand was the company that really originated containerized shipping. U.S. company founded by Malcolm McLean. But subsequently, that company got bought up by Maersk. But Sealand had some of those initial contracts under the Maritime Security Program. And when Maersk bought Sealand, there was issues about whether or not Maersk could keep those contracts. Maersk had to create a subsidiary, Maersk Lines Limited, in the United States to keep those contracts. But there were concerns that Maersk Lines, which is owned by AP Moeller in Denmark, that the foreign company would have more control over the ships than the U.S. company. Well, now Maersk has about 20 ships in the MSP. They get $5 million per ship per year. So you're talking about $100 million per year they rake in on this program. Additionally, as part of the Maritime Security Program, uh, they also are under contract to the U.S. Transportation Command to move DOD cargo, everything from uh, personal items for family members of, of military uh, military members and their dependents around the world to military equipment moving around. So, you know, Maersk is the, the biggest operator of ships in the MSP. And so they play an inordinate role in American military strategy. And what is being reported by G Captain, and I'm hearing from my sources, both in the commercial industry and in DOD, is that Maersk is not going to let even their U.S. flagships transit the Bab el-Mandab. We saw that with Mayor Chicago again making that U-turn coming around. Maersk Kensington right now is hove to in the Red Sea. Now, I'm 
I was initially thinking she was waiting for Liberty to come down and they would escort the ships together through the area, but that doesn't appear the case. And while other Maersk ships are heading to the Bob El Mandab, there is no indication that they're going to go through. What I'm hearing and what I think has happened is this. It appears to me that Maersk has made a play to the U.S. government, basically. They've basically told them that it's either all our ships or none of our ships. In other words, they're not going to allow just the U.S. flag vessels to go through with an escort. They want all their vessels to go through. Because again, go back. This represents 2.5% of the ships going through the Suez. But what it does represent is over 50% of the world's containers that are moving. So these companies right now, these, these four companies that we're seeing doing this right now, are exercising an inordinate role. Uh, also understand that CMA CGM has contracts through the Maritime Security Program with their uh, subsidiary, APL. Hophog has ships also that are in this system. So all these companies are, are having a role here. But if Maersk is dictating to the United States government that, listen, yes, we receive a subsidy from you to be U.S. flagged, that, yes, we have a contract to deliver cargo for you through the United States Transportation Command. However, we're not going to sail our ships through the Bob El Mandab, even with U.S. Naval Escort, unless you agree to escort not just the U.S. flag Maersk ships, but all the Maersk ships, that is some manipulation going on right there. And if that's what's happening in the United States and if it's happening in other European ports, that is showing you the power that ocean shipping lines have. These are behemoths. These are big companies. They control global shipping. Right now in the United States, there are cases through the Federal Maritime Commission against Mediterranean shipping, for example, for manipulating of freight rates during the global supply chain crisis that led to the bankruptcy of companies like Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, you are seeing right here, if this is true, and again, I... I I would love to sit there and say I've got definitive evidence, but I have a lot of sources. This is not just hearsay from one or two. This is a lot of people telling me this and people I know and have confidence in are saying this, that there was a plan already in place through the Department of the Navy, through uh, the SECNAV's office to begin this escorting of U.S. flagged vessels through the Bob El Mandeb to ensure that U.S. flagged vessels were moving through and create an operation akin to Ernest Will. This would have gotten maybe some companies to reflag ships over to U.S. registry or to over European registries. It would really be the, the, the detriment here would be to the open registries, to Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. It would be the benefit to get ships under national registry so that you can get the protection here. Now, understand, I, under, I completely understand that there's an issue here of global economy, that the world navies cannot allow the shutdown of the Bob El Mandab. But let's be clear, the Bob El Mandab is not shut down. There's still many ships flowing through there. We've saw that only 55 ships have diverted so far out of over 2,200 uh, you know, as of that day. So this is a small drop, and what we're seeing from the Houthi is small scale. We can set up this kind of guard post area right here, but what I don't like is the idea that the shipping companies are trying to manipulate the system, because what they have done now by announcing this is, and by doing this, is, is they're, they're artificially increasing freight rates. They are basically uh, getting uh, uh, use for their excess tonnage, uh, and now they're forcing governments, both in U.S., Europe, and Asia, to conform to this, to, to basically take action to do this. And, and again, Maersk, CMA, CGM, Hophog, and, and uh, uh, Mediterranean Shipping could have said, listen, as of this day, we're going to divert unless you do something beforehand. But to go in there and divert and say, listen, this is what we're doing now. Now you got to fix it. That's ultimatum type stuff. That That's pretty aggressive. And remember, we've seen these shipping companies exert foreign policy already. It was Maersk and a lot of these companies that boycotted Russia when Russia invaded Ukraine. And we applauded that. We thought, man, that was great. Good job. You know, you're, you're, you're you know, supporting Ukraine over Russian aggression. But now here we're seeing an action that is destabilizing ocean shipping and world freight and trade. This is the ocean shipping carriers having a lot of power. 
And this is the danger that does exist. Uh, I, you know, my entire research and studies have been on the interaction between commercial and military. I'm a former merchant mariner. I worked ashore uh, from the business side, so I saw the shore side business. And I've been a historian who teaches courses in maritime security, maritime history, and maritime business. And I literally wrote my doctoral dissertation on the intersection of commercial and military. So this is a very unique situation that needs to be examined and taken a look at. And we'd love to hear that discussion more. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did enjoy today's episode, hey, take a moment and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment. I'm sure I'm going to get lots of comments on it, but feel free to leave it. And I, let me be clear. I get a lot of my source material from people who watch my videos and send me comments. You can access me by email through a variety of different social media means. Uh, happy to hear what you have to say. Uh, leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up. And if you can support the page, because I don't think the ocean carriers are going to be sponsoring what's going on with shipping anytime soon. Uh, you can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. So next video, Sal, signing up.